Open your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And as you're turning there, I, I want you to understand the, the context of this passage. Paul is leading us, he is leading the people at Corinth, and to come to an understanding of what he says is the most important truth that you could ever know. And he centers this on the resurrection of Jesus. You know, that's why we gather on Easter Sunday. In fact, that's why we gather on every Sunday. It is the Lord's Day because every Sunday we gather, we are celebrating the fact that Jesus has resurrected from the dead and that the tomb is still empty. Who's excited because the tomb is empty this morning, just as it was 2,000 years ago on that first Easter Sunday? And Paul says that if you don't get this, that you will miss everything. The resurrection is the most important truth you will ever know. Because the resurrection is the greatest example and extension of God's love for a broken rebellious, and wicked people. It's the greatest act of love. It is the most earth-shattering, earth-shaking, fear-shattering, doubt-shattering, sin-shattering, death-shattering event in all of history. You know, Queen um, Victoria was reigning over England in 1878. She had many children, but her third child was Princess Alice. Princess Alice went on to marry um, a king from a small state of Germany, and then they had kids, uh, but tragedy struck Princess Alice in their home. And they had, of their several children, they had a couple of them who caught a very contagious disease called black diphtheria. And this diphtheria is not only contagious, but it was deadly during this time because there was no vaccine or anything like that for them. And so the only thing they could do is isolate the only thing they could do is keep the disease as isolated as possible so it didn't run through the family. And all of their efforts and, and everything that they tried to do to keep that disease isolated, it went from their daughter to one of their sons. Their daughter passed away, and now it went on to one of their sons. And the doctor again says, listen, if you want to keep the disease at bay, you have to stay isolated. And so the doctor told Princess Alice and her husband, he said, do not go in the room, do not go near the child, or the rest of the family is, is going to get sick and potentially die as well. So Princess Alice stood outside the room of her son as the caretaker was doing everything possible to give him medicine, to give him the care the little boy asked the caretaker, said, why does my mom not hug and kiss me anymore? Princess Alice was right outside the room and she could hear her son say those piercing words. And so she immediately, she burst through the door and she gave all the hugs, all the kisses and said, my boy, I am here to love you. I am here to kiss you and to hug you, knowing that it could have been fatal. Well, a couple of weeks later, Princess Alice did get the disease, and it was just within a few weeks that she did die. But here's what the princess knew, is that she would rather face her death than for her son to be unsure of her love. And this is exactly what Jesus did for us. 
Jesus knew what it took and he knew what it would take to come and rescue us from the disease of our own sin, the fatality of our sin and the fatal blow that it has over our lives. And Jesus knew that if he were to come through If he were to burst through the doors of our lives, he knew it would require his death. And yet he went anyway so that you could be kissed with his grace and with his love. And forevermore, every time we think about the death, we think about the burial, we think about the resurrection. And all we can say is praise be to God for his love for a people who do not deserve the love of God. Yet we are benefactors of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ. And this is why we celebrate Easter, that he knew it required his death, but he knew in his death, you would have life. This is why Paul says, the most important thing I can tell you is the resurrection of Jesus. Of all the things that I could talk about, of all the things that need correcting, of all the the tragedies and the mishaps that are taking place in Corinth, I want to tell you the most important, the resurrection of Jesus. So if you don't mind, would you stand with me? And we're going to read 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 22 together. And and in this, what we are going to see from Paul is that we can have a confidence in the resurrection, knowing that even in our condemnation, that if we confess the resurrection of Jesus, we too can have life. This is what Paul says, starting in verse one. He says, now I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, The gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold to the message I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12. Then he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one born at the wrong time, he also appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, so we proclaim, so you have believed. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses about God, because we have testified wrongly about God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Those then who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. If we have put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. But as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, will you teach us now, God, the importance of the resurrection. Father, I pray that this would go beyond us just recognizing a story in the Bible, but truly penetrating our heart 
because of the transformative power that the resurrection really is. And so it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. You may be seated once again. I think it's interesting that if you were to ask, especially those of you in this room, and you say, hey, do you really believe that the resurrection happened? Most of you in the room would say, well, yes, the resurrection happened. Of course it did. I mean, if not, then what are we doing here? And I would say, I agree with you. But do you believe in the resurrection to the point of giving up your life because of its truth? See, this is what the disciples were faced with. This is what the apostles were faced with. This is what believers in the first century were faced with. And yes, even believers to this day around the world are faced with that they either deny the truth of the gospel, the resurrection of Jesus, or lose your life. But what is clear about God's calling on your life is that if you truly believe, he says, if you want to follow me, then all of you, you must deny your life. You must take up your cross and then, then you can follow me. You see, every person who claims to be a follower of Jesus claims in the resurrection of Jesus. Because without the resurrection, there is no hope. Without the resurrection, there is no true transformative power. Because the Savior of the world, although we can say, yes, he died, yes, he was buried, what good is it if he wasn't raised from the dead? This is the point that Paul is making. He's like, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, your faith is worthless. Everything hinges about your walk with God on this one truth. In fact, all of history hinges on this one event. But how can we know that it's true? You see, Paul starts very strategic in the way that he talks about the resurrection of Jesus. He says in verse one, he says, I want to make clear to you why, so that you and I can have confidence in the resurrection of Jesus. You see, this is where he starts. He says that we can, not only should we, but you can have a confidence in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this is incredible because, listen, you and I, we're not called to a blind, illogical faith. Instead, we are called to an informed, logical, yes, fueled by faith, but not because of ignorance, because of revelation because of what God shows us and what truth tells us and even what historical facts tell us. You and I can have confidence in the resurrection. You know, psychology today will tell you that confidence is one of the most important attributes that any person can ascertain. That if you are confident, you can overcome anything. Listen, I am confident that I should be a professional golfer. (laughs) And I have just chosen today on Easter Sunday to tell you that. All right, I have confidence that I should be a professional golfer. I think it's only right. I really like the game. You see where I'm going with this, right? My wife already turned it down. She said no. So there goes my dreams But my confidence will betray me at some point. Your confidence will betray you at some point. You can be all the confident in the world that you are going to do X, Y, or Z, and and your confidence will betray you. So it can't be this kind of ignorant confidence because I can be confident that I want to be a professional golfer, but if you look at my swing, you know it's never going to happen no matter how confident I am. It's just a matter of fact. You see, what Paul does 
is he doesn't say, hey, you know what? You just got to put your questions on a shelf. Like, don't ask too many pressing questions about the history of your faith. Don't ask too many pressing questions about what is going on with this passage or this passage. Just, just walk by faith, not by sight, and just ignore any doubts that you have. That's not the confidence that Paul is talking about. In fact, every other religion will tell you, don't press too far. Because when you press far, you will no longer have confidence in the truth that it bears. But you know what God actually says? He says, come to me with your doubt. Come to me with your faithless acts at times. Come to me with your questions. You see, uh, other religions say, no, 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 don't really question that. Even though we don't understand it, don't question it. The gospel says, question everything so you may know that the resurrection is real. There's nothing else in the world like it. And Paul tells us, he says, you can be confident because of a clarity not because of that we're shamed because of our doubt. Do you think that, that Moses had doubts? It seems like Moses just walked in doubting all the time. He walked in his doubts. He doubted that he was the man for the job from the very beginning in Exodus chapter 3. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, I know I'm seeing this burning bush, and I, I hear you, Lord, talking to me loud and clear. I heard you say, take off my sandals, and I know that you are holy. I know that you know all things. I know that you created all things, but God, you got this one wrong. Did God just immediately just spite him, and did he just immediately just take care of him and say, you're not going to doubt me? No, instead, the Lord used his doubts to bolster his faith. So that when things got hard, Moses could walk in confidence, not blindly, not ignorantly, but so that it would be stronger and stronger that every time his faith was tested, he would walk deeper and deeper and deeper with the Lord. This is the type of confidence that we are to have, not because we figured something out, but because God is good and God is gracious and he has revealed this truth to me. And so we can't be arrogant about it. We can't boast about it. All we can do is worship God about it and say, thank you, Jesus, for your resurrection, because apart from it, I have no hope. Therefore, I have confidence. See, he gives these even historical uh, evidences. Paul does. I, I mean, Paul, because so now when you look at non-Bible, non-canonical sources about the resurrection, guess what happens? Every historian lines up with the Gospels and the way it portrays the resurrection of Jesus. I'm talking historians who are not Christians. They're just looking at the facts. They can prove outside of Scripture that the resurrection actually happened. It is really easy. There is no historian in the world who will say of any credibility, by the way, I mean, Anybody can, you know, any bozo can get on Facebook and talk about Jesus was not real. Okay, look, there's no credibility there. I'm talking about real historians of people who are actually trained historians of credibility. None of them will debunk whether or not Jesus of Nazareth was a real man who lived and who died by crucifixion. Oh, and by the way, who was buried in a tomb that did not belong to this Jesus, but, didn't, uh, but was never used before, and it belonged to this man named Joseph of Arimathea. Historians who are not Christians claim these things. But then you go a step further. Can they actually claim the resurrection? And all of the evidence points Yes, the resurrection even happened. You see, here is the greatest historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. You ready? The tomb is empty. 
no one is talking about a occupied tomb. In fact, when, when the tomb was empty, when Jesus was resurrected, All of Rome didn't know what to do. The Jewish leaders didn't know what to do. And even up to the second century, the same lie began circulating that, well, the disciples must have stolen the body. This was the rumor. In fact, the Roman guards were paid off who were supposed to be watching this tomb. Because guess what? Rome put all of their resources on this one tomb to guard. They made sure of any other tomb that this one was guarded. We don't want anything happening. There's been a lot of weird things going on with the crucifixion. And then there was like this darkness. There was some chaos in the temple, like the curtain that the Jews think that you could never tear into. Well, that bad boy just was torn from top to bottom. And there's just some weird things going on. So listen, let's make sure that we protect the tomb. So they put guards outside the tomb. Oh, in fact, they, they put a big stone in front of the tomb to cover up the cave so that no one could possibly move it. In fact, historians say that it would take over 20 men just to move the stone an inch. And then on top of that, it had a Roman seal. Now, what's the importance of this? Rome was saying, if anybody messes with this tomb, you also will be in a tomb. That is the threat of Rome, that you will be crucified, anybody that touches this tomb. I mean, it was guarded. They were taking no chances. And then all of a sudden, it's empty. Rome, the Jewish leaders are like, what happened? You know, we know because of being followers of Jesus and abiding to the scriptures that we know that it says this in Matthew's account of Matthew 28, one through two, it says, after the Sabbath, after Saturday, all right, now as the first day of the week, Sunday was dawning, this is the first Easter morning. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to view the tomb. There was a violent earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb. He rolled back the stone and was sitting on it. You talk about a mic drop from God. I mean, they're like, oh, you have all of Rome guarding this. Okay, cool. I have thousands and thousands of angels, but I'm going to send one. Oh, and then after he's done with his work of rolling the stone and he's going to cause an earthquake, I mean, some cool things are going to happen. He's just going to sit on top of your stone like it's no big deal. God will not be mocked, nor will his plan be thwarted. You see, all of Rome could not keep Jesus in a tomb. Are you kidding me? You think some some stone is going to keep Jesus in a tomb? If all of Rome put every soldier, he would have destroyed all of them. Not even the gates of hell could keep Jesus in the tomb. If, If Satan were to gather all of his minions to create the largest army, that's not going to keep Jesus in a tomb. Your sins doesn't keep Jesus in a tomb. Death doesn't keep Jesus in a tomb. There will be nothing that will thwart the plan of God so that you could have life eternally. You see, because of this, because that God's plan will never be different. God's plan will never be deterred. You can have confidence in the resurrection. You see, this confidence makes us walk uniquely on the earth. Not arrogantly, but knowing that if you are in Christ Jesus, that even at the end of your time here on earth, you will be resurrected with him. The way that Jesus describes it, one of my favorite verses, is that Jesus says this. He says that even if you die, you will live. 
What could ever come between you, Paul says, that nothing could separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing could pluck you from the hand of God. You are secure in him for those who have faith, those who believe in the resurrection, not just are aware that the resurrection happened, not just appreciate the resurrection, not just show up to celebrate the resurrection, but to know it personally to believe in it personally, to trust in it eternally. Why is this necessary? Because what Paul moves to from our confidence to us recognizing our condemnation apart or without the resurrection. See, this is what he says in verse 12. He says, Uh, excuse me, verse 16, he says, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. Why? Because you still remain condemned. You still remain in your sins. You see, every single person in this room, we have a few things in common. Number one, every single person in this room has one dad and one mom. Every person in this room has a grandparent. You have a grandfather and a grandmother. You have great-grandparents. You have great-great-grandparents. Okay, you see where I'm going with this. Every single one of us have this in common. And because of that, every single one of us has this in common, that we are lost in our condemnation. We stand rightfully, by the way, condemned before a holy God. You see, this condemnation was ushered in in Genesis chapter three as soon as Adam and Eve thought that their way was better than God's. I mean, think about what the Lord said to Adam and Eve. He said, look around you. You can have anything you want. You know, every time I read this, I think about my granny. And notice that I, not, I, did, I did not say my grandmother. I'm from Georgia. She was my granny, all right? And granny, as most of you would know as well, grannies of the South, they can be pretty mean at times, right? It's just a reality. I remember when I was really young uh, that my grandmother said she, and they just had this awesome backyard, and my granny always had the best garden, she had the, listen, they, she had banana peppers that were so fresh. They would just slap you. I mean, they're so good. But my granny was proud of that garden. She took me outside and she would say, Michael, look, look at this backyard. And it was beautiful, man. They had oaks. They had a fig tree dropping fresh figs. You just eat right off the ground. I don't know if that's good for you, but it sure tasted good. My granny would say, listen, you can play anywhere you want inside this fence. Do not play in my garden. Well, this just made me very curious. Like, what is so special about the garden that I can't play in it? Like, what is so great about it? I mean, I know I have all these trees to climb over here. I have figs. I have these oaks that I can climb. And I have a BB gun that I can shoot squirrels with. And I have all these fun things. But what is it about that garden? I just wanted to go play in it. I thought, surely there's treasure in there. She doesn't want me in there. There's got to be gold or something. So I went to digging in my granny's garden. And she came out, one of the trees that she would not let my grandfather cut down. And I say grandfather, but I called him my pawpaw, all right? She did not let my pawpaw cut this tree down because it made the best switches for spankings. (laughs) I told you my granny was something. Godly woman, but boy, she was not going to withhold the rod, all right? And she took with them switches, and I learned why that tree made such good switches. They were light. And just, whew, whew, I mean, like Zora with that sword just slicing my leg. But, but, but here's what she said to me. She said, Michael, I told you, you could play anywhere you want. This is what happened with Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter 3, after they chose their own way, this is what it says in verse 8. It says, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord. 
They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. So the Lord called out to the man, and he said to them, where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. I mean, you can see the weight of this that is coming down on Adam. He's like, listen, something happened, and I was completely aware of my brokenness. And the Lord says, who told you that you were naked? Who told you that you were broken? Who did this? You see, they attempted everything possible to cover up what they broke themselves. They sewed fig leaves together. They hid. The bushes couldn't hide them. The fig leaves couldn't cover them. And all of this is an attempt to cover up our own condemnation. And you and I do the same things. We hide from God. We try to do our own thing. We try to cover it up with morality. We try to cover it up with good decisions. We try to cover it up with our wealth, with, with our family, with our marriage, with our jobs. We try to cover it up in so many ways. But at one time coming soon, everything in your attempt will come to an end and you will come face to face with your own condemnation before God because every single one of us are faced with the same disease and it's worse than black diphtheria. It's worse than what they had. It is sin and it covers not just our lungs with blackness, it covers our whole body with blackness and we are in desperate need of a Savior's touch of grace. This is why Paul victoriously could say that apart from Christ, there is nothing but with him. He says in Romans 8, 1, he says, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, there's no condemnation over your life. There's no sin over your life that you can have righteousness, that you can have the inheritance of God himself because it is the gift of life and it is the gift of eternity. And this is not a gift that you have to pay for. Jesus already paid for it. He purchased it with his own blood and he looked at you. He looked at me. He knew you by name. He knew every sin. He said, I'm going to go to the cross anyways that while you're a sinner, I'm going to die for you so you can have life eternally. It is in the death of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that you and I will one day be resurrected for those who are in Christ Jesus. But how do we get there? See, Paul talks about, he says, listen, you got to be confident. You got to know your condemnation. And if you want to be in Christ, you must confess. See, he says, he talks about our confession according to the resurrection. He says this in verse 20, but as it is, Christ has been resurrected. He has been raised from the dead. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man, being Christ. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive with him. You see, Jesus went to the cross so that in our confession of the resurrection, of the gospel, that we would have life. But so many times, this is the point that we get to, and then we check out. Every Easter, Another Easter comes by, another Sunday comes by, and we know the resurrection is real. We have confidence in it. We know that we're sinners. We've been told this since we were young. If you have ever been in any Sunday school class, and especially our church, you're going to know that sin is real and that you are a sinner. Why? Because that's what the Bible teaches. You know these truths, but so many are just short of a true confession of Jesus. See, there was a man of World War II. He was in a battle with uh, Hitler's army, but he was in a battle in North Africa in 1943 where uh, in that battle in Tunis. And, and thousands of Germans were captured. 
thousands of Germans were taken to a, a, a prison of war, and including a man named George Gartner, or in German as Jörg Gartner. But I'm going with his English name, George, all right? But George Gardner was a prisoner of war. He was tried. He was convicted as a war criminal. And from there, he got transferred to America. He went through Texas. He went to New Mexico. And he was finally in this prison to where he one day escaped. Many prisoners of war escaped during that time, by the way. And there were several dozen prisoners. And and throughout the years, George would hear another prisoner of war was found and was taken back to prison. Another man was found and then down to Hitler's last soldier in America was George Gartner. He was married, going under the alias uh, that was... Uh, Dennis Wiles. He married Miss Jean Wiles. And every couple years they would move because George was so paranoid of getting caught. And so every couple years, and Jean did not know anything about his past. She thought he was an orphan in New York, from New York. Until finally about after 20 years of moving, Miss Jean had enough. She said, I can't move again. What are you running from? Why do we keep moving? What are you so paranoid about? What are you keeping me away from? And finally, George broke down. And he said, listen, I need to tell you something. I'm a prisoner of war. And and he just spills all the beans. And Miss Jean just looks at him and says, the only thing you can do to have your freedom is to confess. And so George did that. They got a lawyer and they went to the FBI And he made his confession. Everything came out. What is incredible is that through this confession, not only was he no longer paranoid about getting caught, no longer did, was he not ashamed of of his past, but he was given a new citizenship with his wife, Jean, as an American. You see, this is exactly what happens So many times we just keep kind of moving from season to season to season to season. And we wonder, like, why why is life just still not going great? Why are things just happening in this way? Why do I not have peace? Why do I not have freedom? Why do I feel so enslaved? And it's because you haven't confessed. And Jesus is calling you today not to be aware or to appreciate or to just gaze upon the resurrection, but to confess the resurrection, to to confess Jesus as Lord and for him to save you from your sins so that you could have your freedom eternally and not just be a citizen of America that's going to end, but to be a citizen of heaven with King Jesus forever. Have you made that confession? Do you know that Jesus is the Lord of your life? Do you know that he has saved you? Are you walking in this confidence? Are you aware of your condemnation? And if so, do you have a true confession of Jesus Christ as your Lord? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, will you help us right now understand whether or not we have truly confessed you as Lord Father, so many times we just move from step to step, from thing to thing, to, from season to season, year to year, never even recognizing our relationship with you. Because, Father, we know for sure that if we have confessed you truly as Lord, that, that our position with you changes, that we are no longer children of wrath, but we are objects of your love. Our position changes from unrighteous to righteous. Our purpose in life completely changes. And Father, even our own personality changes because we become more like you every day. So Father, would you make it clear right now of whether or not we belong to you. Father, we praise you for the resurrection 
of Jesus. And all of our hope is in you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.